Uh, welcome once again to the JQI seminar. Charlie Santori from HP Labs in Palo Alto, California is our speaker today. He will talk about uh, diamond photonics using NV centers and speed sensors. Uh, Charlie did his undergraduate work at MIT, his PhD at Stanford, and has been at HP since 2005. And before he starts, I just want to remind the fellows that there is a fellows meeting afterwards in the conference room on the second floor of CSS. <coughs> not a fellows meeting, just a PSC space meeting. No, I see. It's not a full-on fellows meeting. No, not a full-on fellows meeting. Okay, so if you have space, or Labs. thought you had Labs. to have space, then come to the meeting. Anyway, Charlie. Okay. Well, thank you, Glenn, for introducing me. And I'd first like to thank Glenn and Jake for inviting me to give this seminar today. And um, as the title says, this talk is going to be about um, work that I've been doing in the large-scale integrated photonics group at HP Labs over the last few years um, related to um, things that we can do with nitrogen vacancy centers and diamond, both, both for quantum information processing and for um, magnetic sensing. Um, so here's just a very brief outline of what I'm going to cover. So I'm first going to try to give you an idea of what it's like to work with single um, nitrogen vacancy centers, particularly at low temperature, um, with optical spectroscopy. Um, then the main part of this talk is going to be about our um, attempts to couple MD centers to various kinds of micro cavities and wave guides. And then at the end, I'm going to discuss um, just briefly a few other things. Um, both involving MD centers and another project that's just starting up. Um, and I'll just add that um, if you have questions along the way, um, please don't hesitate to ask them, and I'll have a better idea of whether this is making any sense. Um, OK, so to start at the very beginning, um, I'm guessing you've probably had speakers talk about MD centers here before. Um, so, But I'll just give a very brief introduction to what it is. Um, so first of all, um, this picture here is meant to represent a, a diamond lattice, so these yellow balls are carbon atoms. And the nitrogen vacancy center is, is what we get if we replace one of the carbons with a nitrogen atom and replace its, well, just remove its nearest neighbor carbon to create a vacancy. And so there are, um, because car diamond is tetrahedrally bonded, there are four possible orientations for the vector from the nitrogen to the vacancy along the four 1, 1, 1 crystal axes. And also, if we care about interchanging the nitrogen and the vacancy, this gives a total of eight different kinds of MD center, um, which, which are all equivalent. But if, if you're doing optical spectroscopy, they'll have different polarization dependence or magnetic field dependence. Um, OK, so the reason that many groups are now interested in this defect is um, it's a paramagnetic defect, meaning that it has an electron spin. And this spin has um, fairly long coherence time, ranging from on microseconds to milliseconds, depending a lot on the material quality. And it's recent, recently been shown, for example, by a group at Harvard that you can extend this coherence time um, to something approaching a second with dynamical decoupling techniques. Um, and furthermore, this defect can be, um, the, the electron spin can be both controlled and detected optically at, at the single defect level. Um, for many kinds of experiments, you can do these things at room temperature. Um, but I should say that most of the measurements that I'm going to show in this talk are actually low temperature, and that's necessary in order to have sharp optical transitions. And then finally, um, these can be made in a semi-controlled manner through um, implanting nitrogen ions and following some annealing recipe, and this can be done in synthetically grown diamond crystals. And um, so if you want to work with a single ND center, the first thing you have to do is to find them. And, and typically the way this is done is with um, scanning on focal microscopy. And um, so, so what that means basically is that we're focusing a laser to a, a very small spot inside the volume of the crystal. And then we're collecting the, fluore the resulting fluorescence and we image that onto a pinhole in order to get some depth resolution. And um, if we do that, this is the sort of image we can get. And this is, this is a false color image where the polarization dependence has been encoded into color. And so um, from the color here, you can distinguish between the four different orientations of the MD center. And um, there has been a lot of work over the last few years to understand the energy level structure of the MD center. And this cartoon here shows roughly um, how the, the level structure is understood now. And um, basically, we have um, 
a, a set of ground states consisting of an orbital <coughs> singlet with three spin sublevels, and the lowest energy <coughs> sublevel has um, spin projection zero along the nd axis. And then due to a spin-spin interaction, there's <coughs> an approximately 2.9 gigahertz splitting to this degenerate pair of, of um, spin plus or minus one states. And these are connected by optical transitions to a set of six excited states, which are formed from an orbital doublet, and again, spin triplet. And if we have no applied electric field or magnetic field, this level structure is determined mainly by a spin-orbit interaction. And the result is that the spin zero states um, end up being in the middle. Um, but typically, in a diamond <coughs> crystal, there's a fairly um, large um, random electric field or, or string that splits these orbital states apart by um, say even in good quality diamond on the order of 10 or 20 gigahertz. Um, so you end up with these two separate orbital branches and um, once these are well split, um, the spin sublevel ordering is, is similar to the ground state. So we have the ms equal zero state at the lowest energy. And as a result of this, there's some intermediate range of electric fields where we can have avoided crossing in, in this lower branch of excited states. And so you can get a, a so-called lambda system where you have um, a single or, or pair of excited states that are coupled by optical transitions both to the um, ms equals zero ground state and to ms equals plus or minus one states. Um, but at the same time, the optical transitions to this upper branch remain um, to a fairly high degree spin conserving. Um, so with the same NV center, you have access to both lambda type transitions and to cycling transitions. Um, one other thing just to mention about this is that for Especially for room temperature experiments, another feature that's very important is that um, certain of the excited states, um, primarily states with um, MS equals plus or minus one um, spin character, um, have a relaxation pathway through a set of singlet states. And as a result of this, if you just excite an NV center um, off a resonance, so say with a green laser or a green LED, um, you can spin polarize it 90% um, or better into this MS equals zero spin state. And so this is what allows um, essentially the room temperature experiments to work. And also the fluorescence is brighter if you start an MS equals zero, so this gives you a way to read out this thing. Um, but at low temperature, um, one way to see this kind of structure is just um, a simple photoluminescence measurement. So this is high resolution photoluminescence spectroscopy. Um, this is work done by, I'm sorry, uh, by Victor Acosta in our group, and um, what you see here is mainly the splitting of the upper and lower orbital branches of the NV center as an electric field is applied to the NV center. And um, we have the resolution here to resolve different spin transitions, but the reason you don't see so many is because of this optical pumping effect that I mentioned. So the NV center spends most of its time in the MS equals zero state. Um, however, as, as I said, because of this, the non-spin conserving transitions that occur over a certain range of electric field, you can get this um, satellite peak that appears about three gigahertz lower in energy, which corresponds to transitions down from, from MS equals zero type excited state down to MS equals plus or minus one ground states. Um, the way people usually um, try to understand the structure of the MD center is through laser spectroscopy, um, or also called voluminescence excitation spectroscopy, where you're sweeping a laser frequency across the um, the zero phonon transition frequencies of the MD center, and at the same time you collect fluorescence into the phonon side. Band. So you can get data like this here, which um, tends now to agree pretty well with theoretical models. And um, I guess one small point to mention here is to see all these transitions, you have to prevent optical pumping from occurring, and usually this is done now by applying some weak microwave excitation to keep the ground states equally populated. Um, one thing that we can do with the system because it has the lambda type transitions is coherent population trapping. Um, and just briefly what this is, um, is um, suppose again we have two ground states um, that are metastable and are connected by optical transitions to a common excited state. If we excite both these transitions on resonance with lasers, um, in a rotating wave picture, um, the Hamiltonian looks just like this. So these are the two ground states, and this is the excited state. And you can see just by looking at this that there is a state with zero eigenvalue um, that's a superposition of, of these two ground states and has no amplitude in the upper level. And 
then if you include spontaneous emission, this state is still stable because it doesn't have any excited state population. And so once you include that, um, you'll tend to optically pump the, the system into this dark state. And usually the way this is seen is you scan one of these laser frequencies across its transition, and only when it's on resonance, you'll see this characteristic decrease in fluorescence. So it looks like a broader peak with a dip in the middle of it. And so we can see this with ND centers. Um, in this particular experiment, we're using a single laser that we sent through a phase modulator to create sidebands at plus or minus about 3 gigahertz. And as we scan uh, one of the sideband frequencies across um, the corresponding transition, um, we see first the, the broader peak and then the dip in the middle of it. Um, so this is a measurement on a single ND center. And because of that, you see this kind of random blinking on and off, which um, is now generally believed in the community to be due to um, photoionization, um, which causes charge state fluctuation in the ND center. Um, and generally, the way this is reversed is by applying, so you do a, a laser scan, and then you excite non-resonantly with this green repump pulse, which sometimes um, brings the ND center back to its negatively charged state, which is the charged state that we're trying to keep it in. Um, but it's a, even this repumping is a stochastic problem sorry, stochastic process, and generally controlling the charge state of the MD center is one of the biggest problems in this system. Um, so that gives some idea of, of what single MD spectroscopy looks like. So um, I want to now get into um, the main reason that over the past few years we've been interested in the MD center and why we've been working on the cavity structures that I'm going to be showing in, in a few slides. And our main motivation has been to try to use NV centers for quantum information processing. And um, as, as I said, the NV center has some nice properties that make it look attractive as a single isolated qubit. Um, but in this system, and as well as many other systems like quantum dots, one of the biggest challenges is how to connect many of them together to do something large scale. Um, so um, there have been a number of approaches uh, proposed to do this. And I mentioned some of them here. The simplest is direct spin-spin coupling. So you just put NB centers very close to each other so that their magnetic dipoles can directly couple. And the, the um, main reason to do this is because this would work at room temperature um, as opposed to all the other techniques that I'll describe. And this has actually already been demonstrated that with two NBs um, placed close together that you can entangle their states. Um, this was worked by the Russian group at Stuttgart. Um, but as you can imagine, they have to be very close on, on the order of 10 nanometers to have um, enough dipolar coupling to even be able to do a few operations within a coherence time uh, of the spin. And so you end up with a trade-off between addressability, you'd like them farther apart so you can separately image them, versus interaction strength. Um, and then also, as you can imagine, doing more than two is, is a fairly extreme fabrication challenge, how to have a regular array of ND centers that are all, say, 10 nanometers apart. Um, another approach that's been proposed is to use superconducting qubits and, and cavities as, as a bus to connect ND centers. So now we're talking um, both low temperature and fairly weak interactions. Um, and then finally, the approach that we and some other groups are interested in is using an on-chip optical network to connect ND centers together. And the Main advantages of this approach are possibility for fairly fast operation, limited mainly by the spontaneous emission lifetime of the ND center. Um, and we could do this with micron scale devices. And also, if we're interested in transmitting quantum information to the outside world, this is a possibility since we're looking at optical frequencies. Um, but there are, of course, disadvantages as well. Um, as I said, we end up having to work at low temperature in order to get narrow optical transitions. Um, and even then, we have difficulties with spectral inhomogeneity of the NV centers and also um, stability of the optical frequency, which I'll show you later in the talk. Um, but just to make this a little bit more concrete, um, so, so I'm, I'm sorry that this will probably be too basic for like, people in Chris and Rose group who are beyond this already, but um, this just illustrates how one could use an on chip photonic network to say entangle two NV centers. And so this is just. Um, the well-known Cabrillo et al. scheme in the language of, of um, chip integrated devices. So imagine that we have 
two devices. Um, each one has a single MD center coupled to an optical cavity. And we first um, isolate a lambda type system in the MD center. Um, as I explained, this can be done. Um, we initialize each system into some state that we call zero. Um, and then we weakly excite these two devices so that sometimes a Raman transition occurs from state zero to state one. And in the process, a single photon is emitted. And we then collect the light from these two devices, interfere them at a coupler uh, or 50-50 beam splitter, and then send the outputs to detectors. And if this um, photon interference works right, then detecting a single photon here will herald that you have created an entangled state where one of these empty centers is emitted a photon. You don't know which one, but there's a definite phase between these two possibilities. Um, but if, if the interference doesn't work properly, this phase will be randomized, so we effectively have a mixture of one or the other emitted a photon, which is not very useful. Um, and to have a definite phase, um, the most difficult requirement is that the photons emitted by these two NV centers have to be um, temporarily and spectrally indistinguishable from each other. Um, but the first problem is, um, how to efficiently collect the photons emitted by the MD centers. And there are two general approaches that people in this community are pursuing. And the simpler one is to use something called a solid immersion lens, as illustrated here. This is a picture from Ronald Hansen's group at Dell. Um, they've been very successful in, successful in using these. Um, people find that these give something like a factor of 10 improvement in the signal you can collect. So. Um, Diamond has a fairly high refractive index, it's about 2.4. And so if, if you have an MD center beneath a, a planar interface between diamond and air, most of the light that gets emitted will be totally internally reflected. And even with a high numerical aperture lens, you won't collect very much of it. Um, so in this case, you can, in principle, collect up to half of the light from the MD center. And using this kind of structure, the Hansen Group has recently demonstrated entanglement of two NDs using um, a measurement-based scheme different from the one that I showed. This one is actually based on, on two photon coincidences. Um, but it's, a, it's, it's actually a huge milestone <coughs> in this field. And I don't think this experiment would have been possible at all without this factor of 10 increase in, in the count rate. Um, but nevertheless, they still had to integrate a really long time. So they reported something like one event every 10 minutes. Um, and so they were, they were basically integrating signal for days to show that they were creating entanglement. Um, the, the other sort of approach, which is the one that I'll be describing, is to um, couple the MD center to some kind of resonant cavity structure. Um, this picture here is taken from some recent work by the Longcar group at Harvard. Um, this is showing a nano beam photonic crystal cavity. Um, and the, the main reason to do this is that we have a chance um, not only to improve the collection geometry, but to um, force most of the spontaneous emission of the NV center to go through this desired zero phonon channel. Um, so normally only about 3% of the photons occur through this sharp line, and in this way we could hope to force um, more than 50% of the emission to be through this, this uh, line where there's some chance of getting spectrally indistinguishable photons. Um, but the downside of this approach is that, of course, the fabrication is much more challenging. Generally, we need some additional means of tuning the cavity resonance because um, it's not possible to make um, 100 of these cavities and have them all be at the same resonance frequency. Um, and furthermore, the NV center, if, if this is a small mode volume cavity, has to be within 100 or 200 nanometers of a surface. And as you'll see, that's also something to be concerned about. Um, so um, generally what we're trying to do, again, is to make the interaction between an incoming photon either from free space or in a single transverse mode waveguide, um, make the interaction between that photon and the spin of the MD center more efficient. And in particular, we'd like to force most of the spontaneous emission to occur through a zero phonon line of the MD center. And the enhancement of the desired transition is described by this very well-known Purcell formula. And it's proportional to the quality factor of the cavity. That's just the ratio of the cavity optical frequency divided by the rate that energy leaks out of the cavity, um, and it's inversely proportional to the, um, the mode volume of the cavity. So we want very small cavities with very um, narrow alignments. Um, some special difficulties for doing this in diamond is, is probably the biggest one is that we don't have uh, an SOI-like material. So 
by that I mean silicon insulator, um, where you have your the material of interest on with, with a very well controlled thickness and very smooth layer on top of a um, lower refractive index cladding layer. And because we don't have this, um, we end up having to do a lot of work to figure out how to make a, a cavity that can actually confine light. Um, as I said already, we have the small to by waller factor, meaning only about 3% of the light is through the zero phone online that we um, have to overcome first before we can get to really high efficiencies. Um, but I'll start with the first things that we try to create cavities. And um, the, the first approach was to try to couple ND centers that are in diamond nanoparticles um, to some other kind of cavity. And the geometry we chose was this kind of silica microdisc cavity. And this is a typical side view of one. Um, so these are basically disks of glass that are made by um, starting with a thermal oxide on silicon and then a combination of photolithography and um, wet etching to define them. And they have diameters typically of, of something like 20 microns and they confine a whispering gallery type mode that propagates around the circumference of this disk. It's confined by total internal reflection. Um, the nice features of these structures are they can have fairly high quality factors up to a million without doing anything special in the, in the fabrication. Um, and also they can be accessed very efficiently with tapered optical fibers. Um, this is using techniques that were first developed in the Bahala group at Caltech. And in theory, we should be able to get Purcell factors up to something like 30 if we can ideally position an NV center and an particle on the, excuse me, on the edge of one of these um, cavities. And we, we did some work to, to try to achieve this, and um, we were able to, to couple NV centers to these cavity modes. We were able to excite them optically and collect a fluorescent signal out of a tapered fiber. Um, but we found that, in the end, the performance was really going to be limited by the properties of the ND centers themselves in these nanoparticles. And so um, these spectra here give some idea of what, the, what these are typically like. Um, if we buy um, commercially available nano diamond containing ND centers, the spectra tend to look something like this. Um, so this is on a nanometer scale. Um, the zero phonon emission of ND centers tends to be around 637 nanometers, but you see really broad lines of something like 500 gigahertz, whereas the transform limit would be something like 10 megahertz, so we're a factor of many thousands away from, from transform limit. Um, we thought maybe that we could do better by making our own nanoparticles, so if you start with um, what I'll call medium purity diamond, this is one part per million nitrogen type diamond that's been electron irradiated to in a needle to increase the concentration of ND centers. You can see that even the inhomogeneous um, uh, photoluminescence peak is, is quite a bit narrower, um, typically something like 10 or 20 gigahertz. And then we try crushing it up and looking at the particles, and we get something like this. So you see the lines are individually sharper than, than here, so it's some improvement. Um, but you still have a lot of inhomogeneity, um, so evidently the crushing process creates a lot of strain in, in, in these nanoparticles. Um, Nevertheless, this might have been good enough to do some kind of, of first experiment, but we found that when we went to smaller and small, smaller particles, these lines tended to get broader, and also at some point we just couldn't find any of them, and it's not explainable just in terms of the density. It seems like there was something um, about the crushing that was causing the ND centers to go dark in the, in the smallest particles. Um, so a after struggling with this for a while, we, we um, decided it would be best to focus our energies on bulk diamond approaches. So what I'm going to show you um, from here on is, is um, two different approaches. The first one is again a hybrid approach. Um, so the basic idea here is that we have a layer of gallium phosphide on top of the diamond surface and gallium phosphide is one of the few materials that is both transparent and visible and has a refractive index substantially higher than that of diamond. So diamond is about 2.4 and gallium phosphide is about 3.3. And so the idea is that this material um, ha has, a, has a guided mode in it, um, but this evanescent field extends into the diamond and can couple with ND centers that are within um, approximately 20 nanometers of, of the surface. Um, so 
Um, to make these is, is fairly difficult. We, we have the gallium phosphide grown commercially on top of a sacrificial layer. Then we have to transfer it onto diamond, which has already been treated to create any centers near the surface. Um, but we did have some, some success. Um, this work was done mainly by Paul Barkley and Kaime Fu in our group um, over a couple of years. And um, they first demonstrated that you could make waveguides, transfer them to diamond, and see the waveguide modes coupling to ND centers, and then cavities coupled to ensembles of ND centers, and then finally they got down to the single ND center level. And with structures like this, so these are micron scale diameter rings, um, we could get per cell factors of, of approximately five. So we could see some lifetime modification of the NV <coughs> Um But the main difficulty is, is um, it's hard to maintain a high quality factor in the gallium phosphide after all this processing. And um, also necessarily the electric field in the diamond is lower than, than the field maximum. So there's a sort of a penalty factor because you're using this evanescent coupling kind of strategy. Um, so what I'm going to spend more time on is describing our work on all diamond cavity structures. And this is a, a picture of one of the first devices made by Andre Barone in our group. And this became possible because um, Element 6 started offering um, diamond samples that have been polished down to about 5 microns thickness, which is thin enough that you can thin it the rest of the way by reactive ion etching to get to, get to the sort of mode volumes that we're interested in. And um, so um, this picture here is showing a, a um, diamond ring that's about 300 nanometers thick. And it's still large enough that it supports multiple transverse modes, um, approximately eight of them. And the mode volumes are not ultra tiny. They're, they're based on simulations from something like 17 to 32 cubic wavelengths in the material. Um, but nevertheless, this is small enough that we can see um, per cell enhancement. Um, and this is the basic fabrication process. So we start with, again, this 5 micron thick membrane, um, thin it down to 300 nanometers by etching um, originally in purely in oxygen plasma. And um, one of the limitations in this process is that um, these membranes do not have exactly a constant thickness over the whole thing. So, so maybe they, they vary from, say, 4 microns on one end to 6 microns on the other. So when you do this thinning, there's only a region a few hundred microns wide where you have the thickness that you want. So that, that's one limitation, but um, nevertheless, that's enough area to get hundreds of devices. Um, and the fabrication process in, in this first generation of devices was to use silicon nitride as a hard mask, um, and then electron beam lithography using PMMA, um, and then dry etching to transfer this pattern into the diamond, and then a final step to remove the mask. And um, this, this slide illustrates how we characterize these devices. Um, this is a low resolution photoluminescent spectrum. Um, you see the sharp, again, zero phonon line at 637 nanometers. Um, this is the broad um, phonon sideband band emission. And on top of this, you see cavity modes that are lit up by the phonon sideband emission of the ND centers. Um, then if we zoom in on the zero phonon region, you see these sharp lines. Um, so we see. Um, quite a bit of inhomogeneity in the zero phonon line position. So evidently, the because this isn't present in the original material, evidently the processing is introducing some strain that's causing this. Um, and then these two broad peaks here are um, two modes of, of the ring cavity. And then the experiment is to tune these cavity modes across the zero phonon lines. And we do this by injecting gas, um, xenon gas, into the cryostat. This gas condenses onto the devices and effectively makes them bigger and, and redshifts the cavity moves. And so what you can see is that when certain, when these cavity moves cross certain um, zero phonon lines, you see this brightening of the signal, which means that some amount of light from the anti center is being emitted into the cavity mode and scattering out um, and upwards towards our microscope objective. Um, but we don't know the angular distribution of light that's scattering out of these rings, so we, we don't know what fraction of the scatter we're collecting. Um, so to be more quantitative about this, we do um, photoluminescence lifetime measurements to see um, how much the um, cavity is enhancing the total decay rate of the MD center. Um, so we do this with pulse non-resonant excitation with the green laser, and then we measure these decay curves. and um, what we see is for 
the device I just showed you that the spontaneous emission lifetime decreases from about 12 nanoseconds when the cavity is off of resonance to about um, a little more than 8 nanoseconds on resonance. Um, and if we plot the fitted lifetime as a function of the cavity tuning, we see this pair of dips which correspond to the two cavity modes that I showed you on the previous slide. Um, so this isn't, uh, when you look at these numbers, it doesn't look like a really dramatic change in lifetime. But if you consider that originally only about 3% of the total spontaneous emission occurs through the zero phonon line, we estimate that this is more than a factor of 10 increase in the zero phonon emission that's causing this change. Um, so this shows that we can have the ND center emit a lot of zero phonon emission into the cavity. Um, but for this to really be useful, of course, we have to collect this light out of the cavity. And um, in the case of ring cavities, the, the best way to extract the light is by coupling to on-ship structures like waveguides. Um, and eventually, we'd want this waveguide to be connecting to some larger on-ship photonic network. But for now, we just want to measure how much is, is going into the waveguide. So we have grating couplers at the ends, and this sends light out of, out of plane to our detectors. Um, and so, um, this spectrum here shows the transmission spectrum through this waveguide measured with white light. And these dips that you see here are due to the cavity resonances in the ring. Um, and the high contrast of, of the dips indicates that we're fairly close to the critical coupling regime, um, which means that there's almost a perfect destructive interference between the light that's going straight through the waveguide and the light that is coupled into the cavity and then is coming out in the same direction. Um, and that's fairly close to the regime, regime we want to be in if we are in the limit of low per cell factor and we want to maximize the, the um, total amount of light we collect. Because if we over couple, we also decrease the per cell factor. So there's a trade-off between um, what fraction of the cavity light that you collect versus how well the cavity enhances that in the center. Um, and then the best result that I would say maybe for the HERO device is that if we excite an ND center in the ring from above with a green laser, um, tune the ring cavity into resonance with the ND center, and then um, light emitted into the cavity couples out through the waveguide and then we collect it here. Um, <coughs> we were able to get a factor of about 25 increase in the collected zero phonon signal compared with a typical ND center in, in bulk diamond. So the, the last thing I'll say regarding cavities is um, I'll briefly show some work with another cavity geometry, which is 2D photonic crystals. And there's already quite a history of attempting a couple ND centers to this sort of cavity. So the very first demonstration of a functioning diamond cavity was actually in a polycrystalline photonic, um, diamond photonic crystal. This was from Ellen Hu's group um, at the time at UC Santa Barbara. Um, there have been several attempts of it coupling diamond nanoparticles to gallium phosphide photonic crystals. And most recently, there have been attempts by several groups to make all diamond, um, single, single crystal diamond photonic crystal structures. Um, so here's a picture of structures made again by Andre Farrell in our group. And um, the design is, is one where we, we have a 2D photonic crystal, and we, we've removed three of the holes and shifted two of the nearest holes a bit laterally. And this is based on a design by Tom Yanovich Hanish at all that was published a few, few years back. And um, so these have simulated quality factors of about 6,000 and a mode volume of about, of about a cubic wavelength. And these are made following, again, a similar process to what I showed you, except that we have a final undercut step to make a freestanding um, diamond membrane, as, as you see here. Um, so again, we do the same experiment where we tune cavity modes across zero phonon lines. Um, in this case, we get larger signal enhancements so that on resonance we have something like 30,000 um, zero phonon line counts per second, which is pretty good for an ND center. Usually um, for ND center and bulk diamond, you, um, depending on, I mean, of course it depends on what objective you use and it's numerical aperture, but usually it's on the order of a few hundred to a thousand counts per second. And so um, we estimate a per cell factor of, of approximately 70 in this structure. And again, we have enough photons that we can um, pretty easily do a photon correlation measurement on just um, the zero phonon portion of the emission and show that we're collecting mainly from a single MD center. Um, so 
What I showed you so far seems fairly promising for using cavities to enhance ID emission, um, but now I'm going to get into the main difficulty in the system, and, and that's spectral stability. And so these again are high resolution um, photoluminescence and photoluminescence excitation measurements. And this is for the same NB that was coupled to the photonic crystal cavity. And what you see is that even in a single laser scan, the line width is fairly broad, it's something like a gigahertz. Um, and furthermore, it jumps around um, a range of something like 5 to 10 gigahertz. And so this corresponds to, even if we take into account um, the increase in the transform limited line width because of the lifetime modification, it's still more than a factor of 100 away from being transform limited. So if we wanted to use this light to do some sort of um, um, measurement-based entanglement formation scheme, um, if we relied on spectral or temporal filtering, um, then we end up throwing away at least 99% um, of our photons. Uh, and if, if you think about it, that it, an NB center in bulk, um, the best NB centers can be a factor of 10 or more, more stable than this, so we're sort of back where we started in terms of total success rate. So we really have to find some way to make them more <coughs> spectrally stable. Um, so we did some experiments to try to figure out what was causing this broadening. So one question is whether proximity to interfaces is causing this. Um, so you can imagine that an interface has a lot of charge traps um, and these, uh, the charge state fluctuates randomly in time and um, it's known that it's, it's fairly well char characterized how much uh, change in electric field at the site of the NB center shifts the resonant frequencies. Um, and it seems plausible that you don't need very many nearby charges to be causing this. Um, so this is an experiment where we thin um, diamond membranes with two different methods, um, reactive ion etching and annealing just in oxygen, which is the same as just burning the diamond. Um, and then we can look at typical line widths as a function of distance to the surface. And um, even though this is not very high purity diamond, so you have some broadening due to other things in the material, we see some definite change uh, when the ND centers get very close to the surface, we see broadening. Um, so we have pretty good evidence that the processing as part of the issue. Um, and then this is just showing some statistics. So in a given location, of course, since the MD centers are distributed throughout the material, they'll all have a different distance from the surface. So you see a lot of variation in the line widths. But if you just look at the median line widths, which are the big circles here, we see approximately a one over um, membrane thickness dependence. And this is as we would expect um, if we had an ensemble of, of um, so a uniform ensemble independently fluctuating traps on a surface. And we can extract from this a charge trap density of something like on the order of 10 to the 13 per square centimeter. Um, so this is one issue, is, is um, and this suggests maybe that we don't want to go for the very smallest mode volume cavity like the photonic crystals, that we might be better off with the multi-mode ring type geometries that I showed at the beginning. Um, the other issue is just the purity of the starting material. Um, and so. The results I showed you before were starting with something like one part per million nitrogen content diamond. Um, and recently we've succeeded in making um, devices from part per billion purity type diamond. Um, and the difficulty here tends to be that um, in very high purity diamond, it's difficult to keep the ND center in its negatively charged state. Um, but through some combination of, of finding the right process and annealing steps, um, we have devices in part per billion type diamond that have um, MB centers that at least spend half their time in a negatively charged state. And in the best cases, their um, line widths are significantly better than we had before. So um, this is sort of the worst case measurement where we're blasting it with green excitation, which causes rapid charge fluctuation. And then we get a um, broadening of something like um, one and a half gigahertz. And in, in um, I'll just jump to here, in laser spectroscopy measurements, um, in the best case, the, um, the spectral diffusion, so if you, you watch this line that slowly jumps around in time, and the total excursion is something like um, half, of it, half a gigahertz. So this is starting to get close enough to where we can do interesting experiments. And um, one last thing that we can do to try to help with spectral stability is to actively try to stabilize by applying a time-bearing electric field. So this is a demonstration by Victor Acosta and our group showing that we can um, constantly monitor the 
resonance frequency of the ND center and um, feedback to an electric field that's applied with electrodes put on the diamond surface. And in this way, we can largely remove the slow component of the spectral diffusion. Um, so this is without the feedback. Um, here we're using a somewhat smarter repump scheme, so we only apply the green laser pulse when the ND center goes dark. If it's been photoionized, then we apply a green repump. But the green repump tends to cause spectral jumps. Um, but then if we constantly monitor the frequency and, and feedback, we can get a very stable line. Um, now, in a single scan, it's still not transform limited, but it's within a factor of two or three of being transform limited. So, um, so this is this is an improvement. I should say this is not in a cavity structure yet. So, combining this feedback stabilization with a cavity is, is another challenge. Um, so I think I'm just going to. Um, summarize the results on quantum networks so I can talk about a few newer things that we're doing in the group briefly. Um, so just to summarize, um, I've shown you two cavity geometries, uh, micro rings and photonic crystals that can both produce fairly large crystal enhancements for energy centers. Um, and this in itself is, is promising for um, sort of our long-term goal of, of having many energy centers coupled to a photonic network for large-scale computation. but. I would say there are some very serious difficulties that remain for this sort of strategy. Um, one, one thing is that the process that I showed you where we take a, a diamond membrane and put it on, um, say, a, an oxide surface on silicon and then try to fabricate with that is actually um, fairly difficult to get this to work right in the clean room. And, and so our yields tend to be fairly low. And I would say that for this to really be feasible, we still need some way to make it very nice SOI type material out of diamond. Um, I showed you the issues with spectral stability. Um, and then there's finally this issue of, of you really need to independently be able to tune the cavity resonance and the resonance frequency of the MD center. And so gas tuning, maybe you could get this to work. You know, you condense gas over your whole sample and then <coughs> you only blast it away selectively by heating certain devices, but we really would like something that's that are, you know, when you apply a voltage and you tune a cavity, something like that. Um, so I'm just going to briefly talk about some other work. Um, so our group is also interested, along with many other groups, in magnetic sensing with diamond. And so one version of this that I'll show you, and um, this sort of scheme has been published by, um, so yeah, I think the first paper describing this was by Jake Taylor et al. And it's been um, demonstrated experimentally also at Harvard and at Stuttgart. But the basic idea is that we have um, a uniform sheet of NV centers near a diamond surface. And we apply laser excitation, which polarizes all of these spins in some direction. Then we apply microwave excitation that depolarizes only those spins that are, have precession frequency that's resonant with the microwaves. And then if we have a magnetic field that varies in space, um, only ND centers along a certain contour of magnetic field will have the same resonance frequencies and they can be depolarized by the microwaves. And when the spins get depolarized, the fluorescence intensity decreases. So if we just image the fluorescence from this sheet of spins, we can basically directly visualize contours of constant magnetic field. Um, there are some complications having to do with the four orientations of ND centers and, and that the magnetic field is a vector, which I, I won't get into this, but um, I'll just show you. Um, what we've been able to do. So um, this is a um, tabletop demonstration of, of um, a diamond-based magnetic imager. Um, this includes everything, including the power supplies. And this experiment consists of basically taking um, a diamond sample that's been um, treated to have a dense sheet of ND centers near the surface. And then we press it into contact with the magnetic material that we want to image. So in this case, for demonstration, it's just a piece of floppy disk. And then as we scan the microwave frequency, you can see these changing contours of, of magnetic field. And right now, our spatial resolution is a little bit below micron. Um, we're <coughs> working to get this closer to the diffraction limit in diamond, which is more like 300 nanometers um, if we use a solid immersion lens. Um, and um, then we're... Um, Right now, the, the, the DC field sensitivity is, is on the order of a microtesla 
and we're also working on improving this by using um, better diamond material quality. Um, in particular, isotopically purified diamond. So we, we have some work in collaboration with Kohei Ito's group at Keio and Dr. Watanabe at AISD in, in Japan. Um, another recent experiment is um, experimentally implementing a, a scheme that's different from the commonly used scheme for magnetometry. So usually um, what people do is, is you, um, you pump all the NV centers into spin state zero and then you use a microwave pulse to make a superposition of say zero and minus one and you let that evolve in the magnetic field um, and then you apply a second pulse to, to read out. Um, the problem with that is that um, the, the energy difference between m s equals zero and m s equals minus one is determined by the spin-spin interaction, which is um, temperature dependent enough to be a pretty big problem for the stability of this measurement. So this is a scheme that's instead using a superposition of plus and minus one spin states. And so we start, um, again, spin polarizing into m s equals zero. We then do a very um, short microwave pulse to prepare to move all the population to the superposition of ms equals plus or minus one. Um, we let it evolve and then when, when we apply the, the second microwave pulse, depending on the, the phase between plus one and minus one, it can either transition back down to zero or it gets stuck um, up in, in the ms equals plus or minus one states. Um, so this largely reduces or largely eliminates the temperature dependence. Um, and also, it ends up giving about a factor of square root of two improvement in sensitivity just because we're looking at the energy difference between, between two levels that move in opposite directions. Um, the reason it's only a factor of square root of two instead of two is because the, um, the, the spin coherence time also decreases because of the higher sensitivity to magnetic fields. Um, and then finally, um, this is some recent work by um, Vicar Acosta, um, in collaboration with Casper Jensen in the um, Lutker group at Berkeley. And um, so I already showed you coherent population trapping with a single NV center. Um, and this is using the same sort of scheme, but it's this is actual um, electromagnetically induced transparency in a very um, optically thick crystal. So um, here we're working with an a very dense ensemble of NV centers, um, bouncing it around through a crystal um, 10 times in order to get larger optical depth. And um, we're using a, a single laser, again, an electro-optic modulator to add sidebands to it in order to excite um, MS equals zero and MS equals plus or minus one ground states to a common excited state. Um, one thing that I didn't show you before is now they're very easily resolving the um, hyperfine structure due to the nitrogen nuclear spin of the ND center. And so, um, these transmission peaks um, correspond to the middle one is for nitrogen nuclear spin zero, um, and then these outer peaks are for nitrogen nuclear spin plus or minus one. Um, and so in this experiment, um, they ended up trying using this again for magnetic sensing. And um, what's interesting about this is that you can have a sensing head that's all optical, so you don't need any electronics or microwaves. Um, the main disadvantage is it has to work at low temperatures, but we've actually found an experiment where this seems to be um, actually a practical interest. Um, right now, the DC sensitivity that's actually measured is approximately a nanotesla um, over a second. Um, the shot noise limit should be about 80 picotesla, so there's some excess noise that we're still trying to figure out. Um, so um, that's, this is all that I'm going to say about diamond. I'm just going to briefly mention some other things that we're also doing at HP Labs that are also um, really basic research. Um, and a new program that we've started up um, is one that we call the MESO program. And what we're interested in here is in ultra low um, optical power um, switching, um, nonlinear optics, and biostability. And we're doing this in um, semiconductor materials. And what we're interested in this program is, is quantum mechanical effects that occur um, with photon numbers ranging from something like 10 to 100 inside of these cavities. Um, and we're interested in connecting many of these structures together um, into some sort of nonlinear photonic network. Um, and so part of this is that we want um, devices that can be made with fairly high fabrication yield um, so that we can make this um, somewhat scalable. Now this shows some recent results um, 
So this is some work by Kelly Rivar in our group, and she's been studying um, coupled photonic crystal cavities and whether we can couple many of them together um, in a controlled way. Um, so this is looking at um, spectra, um, reflectance spectrum of cavities as a function of distance between just two of them. Um, and um, she's studied systems with, I think, up to about five cavities coupled to each other. Um, and at the same time, we're studying um, what are the various nonlinear optical effects that can happen in these structures. So th these are some measurements by Jason Pelk. And he's looking at amor amorphous um, silicon ring cavities. And amorphous silicon is interesting for nonlinear optics because um, if you're interested in, in working at 1.5 microns, the ratio of the per nonlinearity to two photon absorption is, is, turns out to be much better in amorphous silicon compared with crystal and silicon. If you want to use crystal and silicon, you end up wanting to go to something like 2.2 um, microns or, or some pretty inconvenient wavelengths. Um, so what this measurement is showing um, is, is a um, pump probe measurement where you can see um, actually three different nonlinear effects occurring. So on a very short time scale, um, if we monitor the, the transmission of a probe through this waveguide, we see this initial spike due to the Kerr shift um, over a somewhat longer time scale, but still pretty far sub nanosecond. We see a free carrier dispersion, blue shift, and then on the longest time scale, we see the thermal effects. Um, so with that, um, I think I'm out of time, so I'm just going to finally um, list everybody in our group who's been involved in these experiments. So um, I think I mentioned people who were involved in the particular experiments as I went along, but this is the whole list of people currently in our group. Um, and I mentioned a lot of work by Andre Farron, Kaime Fu, and Paul Barkley, who are now um, professors at um, Caltech, University of Washington, and University of Chicago, <coughs> respectively. And we've had a lot of very good collaborations that have helped with this work. Um, so we worked with, recently with Kudja Fong on this, on this MS equals plus or minus one magnetometry scheme. He's actually the graduate student just finishing up in Chan Wei Fan's group at Stanford. Um, we've had good collaboration with Professor Bucher's group at Berkeley, um, with Kohei Ito's group um, at the Keio University. Um, also, we've had a lot of good support from Daniel Twishin and Matthew Markin at Markham at Elman 6, and finally with the University of Stephen Prower's group at the University of Melbourne. Um, so with that, thank you for listening. <laughs>